Hey everyone, we have a fantastic show for you today. I'm talking with Donna Jackson Nakazawa. Donna is a science journalist, a sought after speaker, and world famous author. She has written books called The Angel and the Assassin, Childhood Disrupted, The Last Best Cure, and The Autoimmune Epidemic. Donna even has a new program called Your Healing Narrative, Right to Heal with Neural Renarrating. And this program is for everyone. This program is a powerful neural re-narrating program that uses science-based writing to heal and mindfulness techniques to help you recognize and override your brain's old thought patterns, creating a new transformative healing narrative to help you flourish in your life, even in the face of adversity. And we all face adversity, but we are made to heal. And Donna is the tip of the spear for how our world will approach healing from autoimmune issues and mental health disorders. This is a fantastic show, and I really think you're going to like it. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Here we go. So, Donna, you're, you've been a science journalist for 35 years. You've written wow, that long, if you well, say so. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm following uh, mm-hmm. you. <laughs> you said so first. Mm-hmm. And you've, been, uh, you've written six books, and you speak everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and your work is... To me, it's it's fascinating, um, but and I want to get into that. But first, if you want, if you don't mind sharing, you are no stranger to hardship and adversity. True. Do you mind sharing just a little bit about about your background? Uh, well, sure. Um, so we think of adversity in many different ways, right? We think of um, emotional adversity, physical adversity, um, medical adversity, family adversity. So. I think probably like a lot of your listeners, um, I'm no stranger to trauma and, um, you know, origin stories growing up in a family, uh, a newspaper family, um, but also a family of science scientists. Um, my dad died of a medical error when I was 12, almost 13, a couple of days before I turned 13. And, um, it was really, really hard. You know, my three older, three older brothers and I had um, a long road ahead to kind of help each other through adolescence and, and college and, um, and lots of other things. And so um, my dad died of an autoimmune disease. Um, I developed a series of autoimmune diseases um, when I was relatively young. I got a pacemaker in my 20s. Um, I was paralyzed twice with a demyelinating neurological autoimmune disease, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, spent a lot of time in rehabilitation at Hopkins and um, spent a lot of my kids' very early years uh, mothering from bed between uh, neurological autoimmunity and and losing uh, my mobility and also um, a couple of other medical conditions. Um, My son was in intensive care when he was born for a long time in the picnic unit, pediatric and neonatal intensive care, um, and had a very rare um, surgery that was needed and a long, long, long recovery. He's a miracle. Um, And our daughter has had her own own struggles. And so it's been hard, right? It's been hard. We have a saying around here that um, nobody's in the hospital. We're happy campers. That's, that's, that's good. And so we have, for better or worse, um, certain adversities that we face in our life, and they're different for everybody. But I think we all come up against loss and grief and loneliness and fear and hardship in different forms, whether it's in the face of losing someone or a relationship that we love or uh, family adversity or adverse childhood experiences, which I've written a lot about, um, or fears over someone we love. You know, we all get caught up in our own head, right? Worrying, worrying, worrying about, um, and look at the world we're in right now. If you haven't faced diversity before, you're facing it right this minute because things are pretty bad out there. This is going to sound like an odd question. Do you have a tattoo? I do not have a tattoo. If you decide to get one, (laughs) 
I think you should entertain the idea of a phoenix <laughs> yeah. because you are certainly an overcomer. Um, you, I mean, I know we all have adversity, but you've had your fair share for certain. Yeah, no, that's very sweet. Um, no tattoos, um, but I think a phoenix is a great is a great analogy, and there are lots of other things in mythology. Really, when we look always at mythology and the journey um, of becoming, it always has to involve a process of facing really hard things. And then the beauty is, and you know, I found this through developing my online programs, that that the beauty is that we can make great meaning out of what happens to us. That's the beauty. Like that's really the furthest edge of our development as humans is to take adversity, which comes into every life and create a narrative of meaning, which comes through understanding what happened, how it affected us, the depth with which it affected us and, and going through that process and then finding the connections and connecting the dots to the story we're living right here, right now and making a meaning out of that, that kind of, I think is one of the um, higher abilities of the human mind. And we get to develop that with whatever stuff we get, we get to develop that higher capacity of the human mind in our journeys. I think that's way cool. That is super, super cool. Um, and that have, it leads me to some questions. Um, and, and I don't know if these are gonna be in the right order, but how there's does... no right order. Okay, good. Okay. Just like life, there's no right order, right? We don't get to control it. <laughs> so how, how does trauma or adversity or just suck? How does that change our brain? Right. So we know that um, the, you know, we have more than 2,500 studies looking at the relationship between childhood adversity and um and later mental and physical health problems through adolescence, young adulthood, and long into long, uh, old age, actually. And you could name almost any adversity in childhood. And by adversity, I mean um, uh, events either in one's household, what we think of as household dysfunction, growing up with a parent or caregiver who put you down a lot or made fun of you or humiliated you. Um, we call that emotional abuse um, or physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, watching siblings be put down or beaten or humiliated, watching your mom be hurt, um, a parent with depression or bipolar or an untreated anxiety disorder, a parent with an addiction and a parent with alcoholism or other types of family adversity, um, growing up in, you know, with substandard housing or in poverty or in a violent crime area, you know, all of these things. And now growing up with school shootings and in a pandemic, what do they all have in common, whether they're family adversities or social adversities or community adversities, or spending a lot of time online, getting liked and disliked or dissed by your peers um, in a public way, all those things put the brain, which is our threat detector, that's its job 24 seven, are you safe or are you not safe? From the womb onward, from the womb onward, your brain as it develops, its job is to tell you if you're safe or not, are you coming into a world that's safe when you're born? And once you're born, your number one job as a developing organism is for your brain to alert your nervous system and your body 24 seven through billions of clues and cues. Are you safe or not safe? And as you look at all of the adversities that we mentioned, the kind of common denominator of all of them is that they're sending a message to the body through the nervous system, which is regulated by processes in the brain that are detecting things we can't even see as we're talking right now, um, sending that message that it isn't safe for whatever reason. It's not safe to be who you are growing up. It's not safe to say what you feel in your family. It's not safe to talk to your dad when he's had a drink. It's not safe to 
tell your mom you don't like those shoes. It's not safe to go out in the street. It's not safe physiologically because there's not enough food to eat. All of those things sound really different, right? It's not safe to sit in your living room because your parent might make fun of you or so on and so on. It's not safe to be nine with your phone, which a lot of kids have phones at nine because everyone is disliking the dress that you posted on social media. The more the brain gets these messages that life out there isn't safe, the more the brain gets stuck into fight, flight, freeze, which I'm sure all your listeners have heard of, you know, 10 years ago when I was reporting on fight, flight, freeze and the autonomic nervous system, it was a very new concept. And thankfully today, it's very, very, very well understood. Um, when that happens, it actually over time shifts the expression of genes. So a lot of genes you're born with are fixed, um, your eye color and your hair color, but most of our genes are really flexible. They're moving in real time in a dance with the environment in response to those messages we talked about. Are you safe or not safe? That's really something that turns genes on or off, kind of like a dimmer switch you might have on a chandelier where you can crank it so it's really bright or it never goes on at all. So our genes are involved in this dance of epigenetics in response to our lived experience and our environment and how safe it is. So over time, when the environment has micro threats, and the brain is sending the nervous system not safe, not completely safe. It may not be so safe that you're gonna die, but the brain doesn't really distinguish very well. It's always preparing for the worst possible scenario. That's its job. These genes that turn on or off our likelihood for disease and illness, they get turned on through a very long, complicated process that would take three chalkboards to explain. But the bottom line is, it ups inflammatory factors as a way of trying to protect us from any coming danger because across evolutionary time, if we were under a minute threat, our body actually had to prepare for a huge threat, attacking you know, uh, saber-toothed tigers or marauding tribes. And the brain is really well-developed over most of human history to take even micro threats very seriously for that reason. Even social threats or being socially dissed or put down because across evolutionary time, if you were being socially dissed, you didn't get the food. You didn't get the protection of the tribe. You might even be isolated outside of the tribe and left to fend for yourself upon which you would meet predators and marauding tribes and you would have injuries and you would begin to starve and your immune system would have to rev up. So long way of saying, we detect threats. Threats talk to our immune system through our nervous system. They tell our immune system whether we should be active or inactive in case of worsening threats. The more this happens in a young child, the more those inflammatory factors send messages to the genes that oversee not only how much the immune system should stay ramped up, but these genes also over time turn on the likelihood of disease, including depression, Alzheimer's, bipolar disorder, uh, autoimmune disease, cancer, heart disease. So that is about as simple as I could make it in three minutes. No, that's great. So do you think with the, the whole threat, no threat, safe, not safe uh, job that the brain carries out? And you mentioned earlier when people are going through their own hardships or, or their own adversity that they get caught up in their heads. Yes. So can the narrative that you're caught up in, the story you're actually telling yourself, can that contribute to the message of not safe and actually make things, the snowball bigger, I guess? That's exactly what we work on in my online program. That's exactly the target of the program. Um, your healing narrative is to get right in on your story because we are making our story as we go. And if we can get in and acknowledge the links between what happened to us and the story that we're 
creating right this minute, when we can get, get in on that and understand how really tight that relationship is to write down to the thoughts we think that are old echoes, but also the places in our body where we hold it, when we can break that down slowly and safely, and let me be clear, safely, we do like tiny dive, you know, don't go down with a 60, you know, don't go down 60 feet underwater, start with five, see how you do. Break, bring in grounding techniques, you know, vagal soothing techniques, go down, start to put the dots together, and then realize that we have this capacity to take this narrative and change it. Because when it was formed, we were just little kids. We didn't know how to tell ourselves a story, right? We were just caught in threat, no threat. And if you are the protagonist of your own hero's journey, the journey you wanna be telling yourself is not the one that's stuck in the mind of a child who is afraid. So, and you may have just answered this, but what is neural re-narrating? Oh, so in our program, um, uh, your healing narrative, right to heal with neural re-narrating, um, I teach a whole bunch of science based. Obviously, I'm a science nerd, right? I've been writing right. science books for a really long time. I've interviewed probably. And they're very good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> a thousand of the top neuroscientists and neuroimmunologists in the world, you know, and they've taught me a few things and I've taught myself a few things. Um, and the distillation of it all, and I've listened to thousands of patients whose stories I've probably each person I work with in the course of writing a book, you know, I listen to for months, you know, I follow them for years and I've learned, I've the distillation of getting people to tell their stories and knowing how we unlock the story is, is sort of combining that journalist's ability to unlock the truth but then that's not enough. That's what I found over the years. We have to get in and we have to re-narrate the story in our neural networks. And that's what neural re-narrating is. We actually have to get in in a way that the brain will let us and allow us to do in science-based ways. And we have to get in and rewrite the narration in our neural structure. That's what neural re-narrating is. So in the, in the healing, your healing narrative, you have two, well, maybe three versions, but you have one for professionals and one for individuals. Version three is coming. Yes. Right. And, and that's for young, for young ladies. Well, young it is for women and trauma and it's, it's, it's coinciding with, um, the next book, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yes. So, uh, tell me, so the one for professionals. Yes how how is that structured or who is that for obviously it's for professionals but it, it's to no, help no them. i appreciate that question i get so we um my project manager gets a lot of emails about that um and we're actually in the process of doing a rewrite of the descriptions because it's a common question it's such a good one right so um as you mentioned um at the outset i lecture at a lot of universities and i also lecture at a lot of medical schools um University of Arizona, Rutgers, um, Columbia, I, I can't name them all, but, but I work a lot with doctors and medical students in training. So one of the things that I've really come to, and, and similarly with organizations um, that provide continuing ed credits for psychotherapists, um, and therapists and social workers, uh, had, we've done this workshop at Head Start uh, for the state of California. Um, so everywhere I go, I'm working with two different groups. One are individuals who are living their lives. They're not in a healing profession per se, um, but they're trying to be the best human, the best parent, the best partner they can. And their story of adversity is hanging them up and they know it, right? We all know it. We all know when it's happening. 
Um, and the other group is a little more blind to that because they've done something phenomenal. And that is they've made practical meaning out of their story of adversity by becoming a healer. They actually entered a healing profession. Often I find to have the ability to offer a sense of feeling seen and known and helped and recognized to another the way that they wish they had felt growing up in their own home or community. And this is a way of making meaning out of our story. And it's a really powerful way to help others. And you do that through your work. And I think I do it through mine. It's a really powerful way, but it isn't the same as understanding our own wounding, going into our own narrative, unpacking it safely and in a scientifically safe way and then connecting the dots, following the breadcrumbs to our lived responses and reactions and emotions right here tonight in our kitchen and in our living room with the people we love and tomorrow morning with work we do and the people we interact with in our work and in love and in play. And so that understanding for the healing profession is there intellectually, but it's often not here. It's often not the place from which they're making their offering. And that means they've skipped over the most important step of all, other than recognition. And that is the step of offering that healing to themselves first and foremost. And I don't believe we can really be the healing force we want to be in the world until we've come to understand and make new meaning out of our own wounds that is encompassed with deep awareness, time, reflection, self-care. It's work, I'm not going to lie. It takes time. It's not in a minute. But until we engage in this process with a commitment to the self, with a loyalty to ourselves and our own story, I don't think we can ever be as effective in the stories of others as we may have set out to be. That took a very deep twist that I did not expect. Okay. That's, that's pretty cool. So just to... I'm, I'm going to spit this back at you and you tell me if I'm on the right track or not. People that become healers are often steered towards healing because of their own past issues in their own life yes. and they want to help others. Yes. So the healing narrative for professionals is for those people because they haven't necessarily actually healed themselves. We just, it turns out we actually can't completely heal, heal ourselves by healing others. It's great to want to try. Some of us try our whole lives, but it turns out it just doesn't really work that way. And when you see the transformation in medical students or therapists who've really gone through this process, um, you know, I'll teach a group of med students um, the workshop that we're talking about, the program, Your Healing Narrative. And, and they've read my books and it's opened them. You know, they may have had to read a book or two of mine to be part of whatever um, uh, lecture or series we're doing. And they get it, they get it, they get it, they get it here. But then they do the work for themselves. And, you know, um, I'm not in live classes anymore. I'm not in live auditoriums. I'm not in ballrooms, you know, with looking out over a couple hundred or a thousand people, I'm looking at Zoom, so it's harder to say, but the shift and the tears, there you can see. And then later, I call them these kids, which isn't really fair, but when they're medical students, you know, they're kids to me. Um, and they come back and they're like, wow, I, I, I couldn't be with my patients in the same way. Or a young therapist, you know, who will be able to say, you know, sitting in my room with my clients, you know, I stopped resenting them. You know, the transformation 
to the healing work than having another, and it goes way beyond physicians. Let me be clear. I do groups of educators and we all get to a point where we're giving so much that you can't help but feel a sense of burnout or even like, I can't take one more. I just can't take, like, I can't help one more person. Um, I can't talk to one more troubled kid or troubled patient or troubled client. Um, everyone has their limits. But what happens is that when we ourselves, and let's just bring into this apparent, right? You don't have to be a healer in a in a healing profession, you are a healer if you're a parent or if you're in a relationship or a partnership, or if you're the child of a parent, we're all healing each other on this long road home. We're all in healing each other with our words and our conversations and our connections. And in those moments in which we're healing each other, powerful underlying neurobiological processes are also taking place. And it turns out we can see these on brain scans. When we're really attuned to each other in this healing way, which I've found requires going through a process of understanding our own trauma, connecting the dots, revising and recreating a narrative from here, as opposed to in the past, then we're in a place where the healing we offer has a depth and a quality that allows us to really be present with the other person. And they feel more seen and known and heard and valued. And guess what? So do we. So we can see these neurobiological processes go on, which turn on in the brain healing pathways that allow for greater healing potential. So I guess that's really what I'm trying to do with my work, with my books and my programs, my courses, is give us all the opportunity to turn on that underlying neurobiological process and potential for healing each other all the way home. So there's a lot in there. Um, so the, the regular, the healing narrative for the non-professional yeah. is really, it's kind of like putting on the oxygen mask first before you help someone else. Yeah, and they, and they both encompass that. But for the regular individual, I'm just not talking quite so much to them as a professional. I'm not talking to them so much um, about their own, why they may have come to the work that they chose. Gotcha. That's, that's really the difference. The difference is not so much in the course material. The difference is more in people's origin stories. Do you, and so when you, when you rewrite your narrative and you get a more, let's say true or more pure narrative mm -hmm. in the stories um, that you may have been telling yourself for years, then that can actually reverse yes. the inflammation in the brain and, the, and, and, and set a cascade of healing in the brain and the, throughout the body. Well, it allows for a series of a cascade of, of um, healing uh, properties in the brain, um, which are, you know, uh, neurotransmitters and oxytocin and other really great hormones, which are the antithesis of fight, flight, freeze, right? Fight, flight, freeze is when your parasympathetic nervous, your sympathetic nervous system at the SNS or what I call the stress now system gets locked on. And the other half of our nervous system is called the parasympathetic nervous system or the PNS. And I call that the per now system, the PNS, because it's a lot for people to remember, you know, all the, all the scientific titles. But so the per now system, when we can turn that on, it is an anti-inflammatory process. We, we call up the body's deeply powerful hormones and neurochemicals, and that shifts neurotransmitters. And over time, we can literally see levels of inflammation go down when we activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So there are lots of tricks for doing that through the body. I bet you're no stranger to a bunch of them, you know? Um, getting in through the vagal system, getting in through the psoas, there are a whole bunch of ways to 
release trauma and anxiety through the body. Um, and so, yeah, you've got it. Awesome. So it, a lot of what you're talking about, and I know this is going to, I get, I get all weird, um, but it sounds like you're, you're helping a person create the opportunity through your program to really learn to love themselves. Yes, that's right. Which, you know, it brings up that, that in the Bible, it says, you know, perfect love cast out fear and fear is not safe, but so love is safe. Mm -hmm. So you're mm -hmm. just helping people create that opportunity to create safety and through love. And, and that's right. We are, we can be safe with ourselves. It's not easy. It's not easy to be safe with ourselves in our own little heads. It's not easy, especially yeah. now. It's really difficult. How do you think social media took over the world? Because social media has a wonderful algorithm for creating fear and unsafety. Chicken and our brain <laughs> latch on to it. And we can't yes. let it go. It's like when McDonald's figured out the perfect blend of fat and and oil and salt and sugar and you know your your brain can't let go of it when it gets it and so yeah it's it's not so easy to feel safe right here and that's the goal See, to, to get rid of the fear making details and to make friends with our fear-based thoughts and bring in another way of seeing ourselves in our own story that makes us know we are safe with ourselves. It's powerful. You keep saying more like earlier, you were talking about the, the med students and you're like, I don't want to call them kids because they're kind of adult. Oh, sorry, sorry. I no. have I have two kids who are who are now shockingly young adults, but so yeah, but, but I I can say kids if I want to. Well, no, I think it's great because like in my mind, the way you're you're saying all this stuff and you're talking about trauma and childhood and then later on in life it can lead to these things. And I'm, you yeah. know, and a lot of people when we grow up, we have kids and and, you know, but we don't really, we don't know everything. We're just making stuff up as we go along, and we're faking it. We're faking it a lot. Yeah. So, so to me though, then when we're really kind of like, like this year during COVID, I'm like, you know what? I don't know all the answers and I don't, I, I and I came to the realization, like, you know what? I'm still just a big, I'm not just a big kid. I'm just, I'm just bigger mm -hmm. or I'm older, but I'm, I'm still like, you know, that the kid trying to figure everything out. That's right. So I'm still the kid that wants to feel safe. No matter, Absolutely no matter what age I am. A hundred percent. And, and it isn't about having all the answers. Cause I think that life would be entirely boring if we had them all. I mean, if you went to your work and went, okay, I know every single thing that I can do to help people. And here it is today. We're going to do a, B, C and tomorrow, a, B, C and 50 years from now, a, B, C <laughs> And 90 years from now, you know, it's, it's oh, why no I write another book. It's why I create another program because it's always changing. We're evolving. What we know is evolving. And we've got to close that gap between what we know at the leading edge of thought and what the leading minds of our times know. We've got to translate that and turn it into beautiful packages and give it to everybody who needs it. And that's that's the goal. And one of those beautiful packages is not to have the answers, but how to feel safe right here, right here, right now. And, 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 and have a friendly relationship to all those fear-based thoughts, which will come and come and come and come and come and come. And, come. and to all those, um, Fear making details. It's a fearful time. COVID is terrible. A lot of people have died. Um, too many people we know or face dramatic shifts in their health because of it. You know, my kids are young. One's at a university. They're, they're, they grew up with school shootings. Uh, 
one of them's out in Berkeley where the file, the fields are burning in, you know, five miles from his, from his apartment every day, every day of the year almost now. They, you know, um, it, it just, it's just overwhelming. There's a lot. The East is flooding, the West is burning, the political hatred and divide, the anti-science, the turning against each other. I mean, I, I obviously, I hope it's obvious I wasn't alive during World War II. I hope that's obvious, but my mom was. And she'll say, you know, we all came together. Like, it was like, I have these butter stamps and you have these and, you know, everybody and she was just a child then but still she had this sense of safety even though it was unsafe you know pearl harbor had been bombed but she felt safe because everyone came together as a community and a tribe right we don't do that anymore we don't have that anymore we don't have any sense anymore of coming together we really climate change the perfect metaphor everybody's got to hunker down alone in their family or basement or by themselves for the next cyclone and nobody's sharing or coming together or giving um in the way that we used to of course as individuals we are i see the work you do i see the work of so all of my colleagues do that's what we get up in the morning to do, but the world around us is burning and shaking and screaming and shooting and dying. And I know that just sounds so terrible, but I say it because A, it's true. And B, if you ever wanted to work on your narrative and your understanding of your story and the science behind that, which I offer up in my books and the, what we can do about it, which I write about in my books and the deep dive into your inner self, which I offer up in my programs and courses. I think now's the time and I think everyone deserves it. Yes. So if someone decides and they're tired of listening to their current story mm -hmm. and they want to come out of the bunker mm -hmm. and, and feel safe and learn how to love themselves and, and create a new narrative, mm -hmm. Where can they go? Oh, you're sweet. So Donna Jackson, Nakazala.com. They can find my courses there. And um, if you are listening to this and you feel moved to do it, and again, I don't, I don't talk to sell. So I want to be clear. You know, I think we all come to the work that's right for us at the right time. So if what we're talking about feels right, that's what I'll say. Um, you can go to Donna Jackson, Nakazala.com and you can uh, my courses are right there, uh, my programs, and there are lots of drop down menus. My team is created for all my books. Um, and if you're listening right now and you want a little discount code, would your listeners like that? I'm, I'm sure. It, yes. Yes, they will. <laughs> okay. Um, calm 2021. So when I, if, if somebody asks me and I'm in an interview or a podcast and somebody asks me, then I give them the discount code. So that's calm 2021 and it'll take off a little bit. And, um, and I think that's always a good thing. Um, also, if you're listening and if you haven't read any of Donna's books, check them out. Uh, I, I think the angel and assassin is a, is, is a game changer for it, mental I, health. I really appreciate that. And um, the angel and the assassin, the tiny cell, the uh, brain cell that changed the course of medicine is really the work of the last decade of genius neuroscientists. I think one of them, well, they're MacArthur Grant winter winners, you know, um, I think one of them is going to get a Nobel, to be honest. Um, and, and it's really, to me, as important as um, the work on CRISPR, you know, um, in the book Code Breaker, it's breaking the code of how our emotional experiences create changes to the synapses in our brain that in turn create our thoughts and mental health or mental illness. 
and it breaks it down and a team at Harvard, a team of young women raising babies and uh, working 24 seven discover this relationship between the body and the immune system and a very misunderstood cell in the human brain that actually turns out to be a cousin to our white blood cells in our body. And all of science had missed it. This little cell in the brain is an immune cell. And when we detect threats in the world around us, which we talked a lot about, these little cells in the body, these, and these immune cells in the brain called micro, because they're small, and glia, because they're not neurons, microglia, they get revved up just like your white blood cells in your body. Like if you had a flu, your white blood cells would get really active and they would produce a positive inflammatory response, but take COVID. That inflammatory response can go awry. It can end up in long-term issues, right? In your lungs, your brain, your heart. In the brain, the cousin of those same cells in the brain called microglia, when they detect a lot of threats or when there's a virus or when there's emotional trauma or physical trauma and all the adversities we talked about and they go, not safe, not safe, guess what they do? They push out, they churn out inflammation, but they also morph from these tiny little nice cells that are helping your brain stay healthy. And they morph into these big, hairy looking Pac-Man like cells, if you're old enough to remember the game Pac-Man, and they chomp up our neural tissue, they chomp up our synapses. And then you can see in brain scans, this loss of synaptic activity is the same loss we see in brain scans in individuals suffering from depressive episodes, anxiety disorders, PTSD, Alzheimer's, bipolar disorder, OCD, and I could go on and on. But once we get it, that our brain is an immune organ, it is dancing with our environment. It's, it's our seventh sense telling us 24 seven, whether we're safe, that it's all happening there, that that's the origin story of our safety and that it's tied inextricably and completely interwoven with our immune system. Once we get that, we can go, hey, I'm the driver. I'm the driver of my immune system in my body. I can affect my immune system in my body through a hundred different ways. I'm also the driver of the health of my brain. If my brain is an immune organ, and we missed it for 300 years, then I can have an effect on its health and well being. How do I want to do that? Yes. And I, I, and that's it. Like, I think it, 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 it takes what we have always thought could happen to us where we were, we're helpless, but it puts us back in the seat where there's, we're hopeful. That's because, right. Because the body can heal. The body and the brain can heal. Yes. The body and the brain can heal. We're very neuroplastic. We wouldn't have survived as a species this long if we weren't highly neuroplastic, if we weren't always changing and adapting. And how powerful to turn that and flip it so that the change and the adaptation is happening with us, with ourselves, and how we are with ourselves, and in all the micro changes that we choose to make in our own lives. And of course, in my book, I, the books, I cover many, many, many different ways to do this. You know, um, yes. it, I don't just drop people off with the science. We're, we're coming up with different ways every day that we can begin to make these micro changes. And some of them we can do on our own. Some of them we need help with. But knowing that it's really powerful. It's it a is. driver to go and make the change. So read Donna's books, check out her new program. Um, Donna, this has been great. It's been really uh, such a pleasure to, to get to speak with you. Great to talk to you, Tim. You ask great questions. You have a good follow-up. You have a journalist skill there. So, Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend.